This episode is sponsored by Compassion and Choices. Leading with a health equity lens, Compassion and Choices aims to empower everyone to make informed decisions about end-of-life care. All communities should have the information and resources to chart their end-of-life journey. Motivated by the impact of racism, inequity, and disparities in end-of-life care, they are connecting with people nationwide to spread the word about the importance of end-of-life care planning and accessing quality end-of-life care. All right, we are at part one of four with our first sponsor from Compassion and Choices for the Black Barbers Dollar. Now, we got some interesting things that we're going to talk about, but it's real life conversations. Now, check this out. Also, check this out. We have the sponsors here that's going to actually be a part of this for part series. And we're just going to let it, let it, let it, let it do what it do. So basically, to my left, I have Zena and Elijah, who are with Compassion and Choices. I'll let them introduce themselves, and we're going to dive into this thing. Zena, you go first. Yes. Uh, my name is Zena Regis, and I am the Director of Faith Engagement and Priority Population Engagement at Compassion and Choices. And Elijah Hall, I'm the African American Engagement Director at Compassion and Choices. So let's dive into this thing. So. Zena, I'm making you my co-host. All right. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. So this episode is framing the end of life conversation. It's something that we don't want to talk about in our community. So y'all, you guys want to bring it to the Black Barbershop. We're at um, Steph the Barber's Barbershop, which is Plush Midtown Barbershop, mm-hmm. right here in Midtown. So Steph, he's here as well, and he's the barber, world renowned barber, that's <laughs> well respected in the community. and. We talked about this episode prior too, so we have some things we need to talk about. So, it seems like you want to kick it off for us, and like, what what is what is that conversation like in framing the end of life conversation? That's such a great word about framing. I think what happens often is our culture frames end of life planning in this financial and legal way, um, and also it's very morbid. Like nobody wants to talk about the end of life, but I think we as a community can frame it in terms of. One, what matters most to us. Two, what we love the most. And three, what we want to leave on that to live far beyond us. And I think when we look at it that way in this communal, spiritual way of looking at what are our values, where what are our priorities, what do we want our grandkids, grandkids to have, we can really have a fuller conversation about what advanced care planning is. Okay, okay. So Elijah. In that regard, so to piggyback off of Zena, how do you want to shape this conversation? Why is this so important to you to have this in the in, in our community within the Black Barbershop? I, I think that's an excellent question. The reason why it's so important for us to be having this conversation is because we're getting behind because we're not having this conversation. So when you go into other cultures, you see that they are much more uh, able to, much more familiar with. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, you know, a couple months ago, one of our uh, board members and African American Leadership Council members, Joel Maldonado, did a uh, Gullah Geechee cultural immersion where we went to uh, Beaufort, South Carolina and learned about the death tradition that the Gullah Geechee practice and how uh, they kept graves above ground and, you know, they had churches that were like three or four hundred years old and all of these stories are being passed down. Well, you know, a couple weeks ago I was in Jamaica. And I went up into the mountains for the first time and to visit the Maroons in Jamaica. And guess what? They were burying their people above ground. When one of the Maroons transitions or dies, they blow a horn and they alert the whole village. And then everybody comes that same day and they dig the grave together. Mm. It is a communal thing. And so the power of this, it's not a sad grave digging. This is power in numbers. This is how we honor this person. And it's not a, and, and so I think we have to understand that we also have to think about New Orleans, right? New Orleans, like when you think about deaf culture, they are parading through the streets. There's a certain way that they honor each other. And, and we have to understand that uh, just as we talk about it in that way, we have to also have a certain way that we honor the planning and the, and the estate and how we take care of the assets as well. Mm. Nothing like that. <laughs> that, was, that was that was a lot. Uh, I told you we was gonna talk about some good things. Uh, Steph, do you want to kind of talk about 
what um what do you some of the things that you have um or maybe talk about yourself and maybe what do you think about this conversation thus far yeah i think that is definitely a conversation that is it's long past it and the scale of the conversation this is it's one of those things where uh, if you have negativity about a celebrity or something like that the word gets around so fast and, and you don't have to be intentional about it it's everywhere but when you talk about stuff like this things you know as far as being responsible legacy and all that stuff a lot of times it's a very one-to-one -one conversation and so the question that i have is how do we get it to be a bigger conversation and i know that we're starting here and with things like this um, but what more can we do? Uh, when he was speaking about the Gullah Geechee culture, I, I started cutting hair in Savannah. Mm -hmm. like Savannah is yeah. Geechee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I actually uh, bought my first life insurance policy because a barber that I knew got killed mm -hmm. and his family had to do a fish fry to try to pay for his final expenses. Mm -hmm. And the next week, a lady came in with, I think it's, I, I can't remember the name. I still have it to this day though. Um, what is it? Is it? Uh, I cannot remember the name of the policy. I got, I, I have the paperwork. <laughs> um, but she came into the barbershop and she was um, selling the, the life insurance policy as well as income insurance. So if I was to get in a car accident and break my wrist or not be able to work, my hands were insured and this is something that I did uh, believe at 19 years old uh, but the thing is the, the policy that I signed up for that I know that I fully understand all the ins and outs of it no but I knew I needed something because I was already a father I was I was 20 my uh, my young, my oldest daughter uh, was just born and so uh, since then I bought more policies and, and <laughs> so if something happened to me they gonna be all right uh, but just getting that education out there. What is it that I bought? How can, you know, you hear certain things like with life insurance, you can benefit from it while you're still alive and take, but see, I don't know how to do that kind of stuff. I know you can, but I don't know how. How? <laughs> the question is how. how? I'm waiting for it. I help just, us, help us. Yes, I just want to applaud Steph for, for taking that step. Um, <laughs> <applause>. <laughs> the <laughs> but really, I mean, because it's so close to my heart. My father passed away last year and he was one, he was that father when we were born. He had life insurance on life insurance because he did not want to leave us um, in any, in any bad situation if he was to die. He lived, you know, long enough to see his children become adults, but he still had those policies. And my mom says all the time, I'm so grateful that in the time of my grief, I also didn't have to worry financially. So I think that is such an important thing. And it goes back, speaks back to that idea of legacy. So many people die and their families are grieving, not only their loss, but also kind of the mess they left behind mm -hmm. because we're not talking about it. And so I wanna say the first step to answering all those questions is talking about it. I have a good friend, her husband, was struck with a terminal illness in his mid-30s. And she said, talking about life insurance, she said a person who was not black was asking her, do you have a life insurance policy and all this? And she felt some, like, some type of way, like, why are you all up in my business? But when they explained, I'm not trying to be in your business, but you can use part of that money now to support his care at the end of life and told her how to do that. And so she was able to take time off from work, support her you know support her child but it was because of these open conversations and so when we get away from the idea of end of life advanced care planning estate planning as this taboo subject that's gonna like make us catch death um we can actually have real conversations about like tell me what's in your policy because that's something that we often are very secretive about if we have it or we don't have it I don't want nobody to kill me for my policy or whatever it is that people say you know but really just getting into the habit of of normalizing the conversations in the way that we're doing now.
Absolutely. And I would say too, also taking it to professionals and taking it to people who are, um, that's what they get paid for, to attorneys, you know, I mean, even naming a proxy and these kinds of things, you know, you are doing, you're taking that action that you need. So you might want to find an attorney who can help you walk through those policies to give you more clarity. Um, but the other piece, uh, I think that's connected to this is, you know, um, when we think about, you know, some of uh, the work that we do, um, because we're we're about educating the masses, we're about, you know, getting to the national organizations, getting to the clergy, getting to, you know, the NAACPs and the National Black uh, you know, Nurses Association, you know, these organizations so that we can work on the ground to get the information out. Um, but also, um, we do events, and you know, for personally, my mother attended, watched one of our events last year, our Journey Home uh, event, where we had a conversation, a comprehensive discussion about end of life planning and care. Uh, it was a hybrid event, and uh, after that event, she shared her will with me, and she had not shared her will with me up until this point. I, granted, I've been doing this work for like two years, and you know, and this is my mother. I'm the youngest. Um, I'm 39 you know and this is the first time we're having this conversation so when we talk about having the conversation that's exactly what we're talking about um and really want to give you those give you that encouragement and the courage to do so wow i think this episode is going to be impactful but it's it's I'm, I'm i'm sitting back learning so much and you know it's one of those things that i'm, I'm glad that we are that there are, there are experts like you guys or that, that are doing the work and educating us on what exactly, how to frame the conversation. What should, what should entrepreneurs latch on to to be able to have that conversation? Like with their loved ones, like where does that conversation start? Like who should we put it? Who should they start talking to? <laughs> Both of you guys. Yeah, we're all excited. <laughs> One of the things I say, with having this conversation is starting with ourselves. Um, a step is demonstrated. Like starting, it's impossible to have the conversation with someone else if we haven't done that work. If we haven't looked at what is, what is my will? What, it, what is my advanced directive? What is my life insurance policy? If we do that for ourselves, I think we already have this running start when somebody brings it up to be able to say, I did that. And it wasn't that hard, or I saw an I sought out an attorney, or I used this resource on CompassionateChoices.com, or whatever it is, we're able to point to how it is and what we've done to, to get the conversation started. Because so often we want other people to do it, yeah. but we haven't yet taken that step. And I think it's a way of looking at our own, especially for entrepreneurs and barbers, and thinking about all the different things about how they want their businesses to continue, how you want your business to continue, how you want your family to be taken care of, all of those things. And just starting the conversation there can be a really important thing. And just normalizing the space for it. I think people, I know the buzzword is like safe space, but having a space where people can talk about death or talk about their concerns without feeling ostracized around it, about it. Like just making it a space where we can kind of, because this can be a taboo subject, but making it an open, an open conversation. I agree 100%. I think that's excellent, uh, Zena. And also, you know, this is a sacred space, you know, and barbers uh, honestly are the therapists in the Black community. So it's, it is healing and it's therapy. Uh, that's happening in the chair. And the barber is the mentor, the father, the brother, you know, um, the, you know, all of that uh, person's emotional, psychological trauma, you know, is going into that barber. And that barber has to shape shift and perform miracles every day with every client that comes in to make them feel heard and to make them feel, you know, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, supported, lifted up and understood. And so we definitely want to lift up what's happening in these spaces. There's a reason why Barbershop, the movie exists, right? Because it's about how do we capture that and how do we um, put a stamp on the, the, the importance of the power of this space. So then to that being, so that being said, then it's also about um, asking the question, you know, 
that as a barber, you can also instigate. You can ask questions that people are not used to getting asked. You know, you have um, some leeway. You have more trust now because you have shown up. You 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 have uh, given someone some advice and it worked out. And they were like, thank you. They came back. <laughs> you know? um, so they trust you. So you can ask, you know, how is this situation going? You have a will. You know, how are you all taking care of such and such? Have you thought about this? Man, you know, um, I'm especially to Zena's point, now that you have done some of it, you know, now you're also pulling from, uh, you're asking based on what you've already done, you, you know, uh, because one of the responses is going to be, oh, you know, are you doing that? You know, you know, how do you know? You know, how is that going? Well, what do you think? You know, would you recommend that? Is that something, you know, so definitely uh, I would say you got are starting to ask those questions um, and pushing people to uh, to start to um, you know see that there are steps that need to be taken right now if they want to secure um, their their you know that that kind of generational wealth that we're talking about yeah, yeah. so like what you were just saying I uh, it's coming back to me. I think my <laughs> first policy was American General. Like, mm. is that a company? I think. I think Maybe. that's. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. And after that, because when I was living down there, there was so much violence happening in the city. Like a lot of people don't know how Savannah is because they do a good job of like making it seem like safe tourist city or whatever. Uh, Man, I think I ended up getting like four different policies <laughs> and was paying on all of them because mm -hmm. it just, it's something like, you just kind of feel that darkness mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but anyway, uh, when I left there and moved up here in 2012, a um, couple years went by and I did take all of my policies to a lady, um, her name is Ashonda Davis and she does estate planning and all sorts of stuff and she actually took all my policies and saw what you know what what i'm paying for all of them mm -hmm. and she was like step you got to get rid of all of and get you one policy and mm -hmm. put every you know find something that works but at the time i just i didn't know what i was doing mm -hmm. and they was like hey this one right here is only 35 bucks a month bet sign me up <laughs> <laughs> well the, the, the good thing about it is that you started mm -hmm. yeah um I actually started as well um, recently, uh, not too long ago. So that's, that's, I guess I will, it will be recent, and um, I'm figuring it out. But here we are. I have some of the, the greatest people <laughs> to my left to help me figure it out. So I think that's one of the main things is just definitely trying to make sure that you do it the right way. I guess because there's different types of policy that you can get, and you can pay more. Uh, you can do is, is it just monthly or the annual that you can do with different policies or what what are, what are, what are some of the different policies that you may recommend? No, I do not know all about the insurance, but I know there are quite, I mean, there are so many different types of policies that it's really helpful to get an insurance broker. And I think one of the things that comes up too is we say estate planning and people think I don't have an estate, that's for rich people. But I love that to see you embracing the term of really like just protecting your assets and your generational wealth and looking about it as going forward. And so I think there are term policies, there are um, whole life policies, but really looking at what financially works for you and your family and your loved ones is really important. Getting the, the right policy and with the right people. Yeah, and it's important that we're having this conversation right now because uh, April 16th coming up is actually, um, you know, a healthcare decisions day. And so this is a day across the country where people are encouraged really to take a step if they haven't taken a step in the in this direct direction uh, in particular, you know, around end of life planning. Um, maybe it's, you know, creating a will, maybe it's starting policy, you know, whatever. Maybe it's talking to the uh you know the insurance guru you know um what have you we have a financial advisor that we work with um that you know i think would be you know someone who we would love to bring into this conversation when we start to talk and dive deeper into um the financial advising piece but ultimately it's an example of the ways that we can get people to start to make some decisions and, and to take some action so that's an uh something that's coming up 
but it, you don't need a day to do it, you know? Um, and I think when you have children, you know, I have three children myself. Um, it does, you know, there is uh, an extra kind of, um, you know, onus or impetus to kind of move and, and to protect and to care for. Um, but also, if you're, you have, uh, you know, parents that are getting older, um, you know, aunties and uncles, grandma, the grandfather, you should be thinking about this as well. Um, because what we don't want and what we talk about is we want to plan beforehand so that if so, so, so that if something sudden happens, you know, everyone's not scrambling the day of trying to, 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 you know, to figure out what that person wanted. That's what we don't want. So the planning in advance is, a, is around, you know, how do you get ahead of it? Um, and and even for those, uh, you know, let's say you don't have any uh, uncles or aunties or grandmothers or grandfathers, it's still important for, for you to do it for yourself and your family. You know, something that you mentioned, Zena, in regards to the estate planning, and, you know, when I was, I guess you can say a kid, wasn't thinking about it, but then, you know, 60 now is still young, mm -hmm. you know? As a kid, 60s look old. <laughs> Just being honest, you know. So one of the one of the things that I think that since even I guess maybe more so since the pandemic for me, a lot of things have shifted mm -hmm. suddenly, mm -hmm. like that, right? And you know, looking at like different peers of mine, people are going away from here quick. Like I mean, people always were passing away. I mean, it's a way of life, but. When you talk to someone or yesterday and then they're gone tomorrow, you know, in their thirties, early thirties, twenties, it's like, what's going on? But then you always doing a GoFundMe afterwards mm -hmm. or a fish fry, like you mentioned. And it's like, is this something that we really need to make sure that we, that's, that's why this conversation is important. And I'm definitely glad that, that we're having it. So, um, so Steph, the, the, I'm, this is a little personal, but did the people that did the fish fry, did they meet their goal? Uh, uh, it was still, it was still, uh, collections and stuff being taken out, you know, weeks after, and then a little bit after that to try to get the headstone and all of this stuff. And, you know, the, excuse the phrase, but the best time to take money for a funeral is before the funeral, because afterwards people live move on, you know, they, right. they keep, they keep going, and that's why I love this conversation, because, you know, I'm always talking about not only financial literacy in business, but in this stuff too, because like right now, you can make investments, you're here, you know, you can invest in cameras and lights and try to generate revenue, but when you're gone, then what? And it's like nobody wants to buy an umbrella until it's already raining outside. Right. And, you know, um, I think that the conversation, I don't know, in, in, in this may be a little bit off topic, but we're in the barbershop. Mm -hmm. So I feel like in our community, a lot of times, conversations come in waves. And so, like, everybody will be on the spirituality tip real heavy and then it'll die out after however long everybody will be on want to be vegan and organic and, and that, that'll come in in a wave and everybody's talking about it and then it'll go away um just like when everybody was talking about doing airbnbs and, and cleaning up your credit and remember all that credit fixing wave yeah. came and then it just goes away so it's like how can we find ways to make this not only be uh a conversation that comes in, in in a wave and if it does cool because we can scoop up a lot of people in that net and you know every person that you help is a person that's been helped and that's cool but just making it last longer so it's not only trendy but something that actually change helps change our way of thinking permanently um you know so that way whether you're here or not your next generation can have a head start and then learning those other financial literacy tips and moves and ways because if something happens to you and you 
kids get a check for a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, two hundred. Are they gonna go spend it all at the mall and get a car and or do they know what to do with it? So like the further estate planning, your actual wishes. Do they get it? How much do they get before 18? What do they get once they turn 18? Is it a does it go into a trust and they get this amount every year? So there's a lot that we have to learn and it can seem intimidating for people who have never ever put even one thought to it. Uh, so I guess finding ways to kind of break it down, make it easier to, to digest so that way we can, you know, make some changes for ourselves. Absolutely. I, I, I really love that. And I think that's, you know, we talk about for us, we definitely, you know, we've talked about the pandemic, but that's the piece um, as well. When we talk about, you know, the celebrities that have experienced this and lost wealth and their families have lost wealth. Um, because there was a lack of planning or the government comes in and takes millions of dollars, right? Um, that to me helps it not be a wave. When people are like, wow, this can happen. You know, they have, it's happening to them. How is this possible? You know, they, you know, so I think it, it gives us an opportunity to have those conversations in the barbershop, in the chair, you know, in real time um, with, with folks that, that ultimately people are usually looking up to you know, and thinking that they're well off and mm -hmm. that you know, they're going to be okay. Um, and, and hopefully it says, okay, you know, I, okay. But then there's also other examples where people do a great job of planning, you know, uh, celebrities as well. Um, and so I think we have to hold both of those up and say, you know, let's, let's, let's study this. <laughs> let's study both of these scenarios. What happened, you know, and why, and how do we prevent this? Wow. You know, some, something that popped in my mind was um, you mentioned in regards to this early on in the conversation. Um, I was just thinking about if one if one of us or if our loved one is terminally ill suddenly, you know, you have to think about who would you want to speak on your behalf? You know, if you can't open your mouth. Who would you want to speak on your behalf? We don't have to answer the question, but it's a deep question. And I think that's a good way to, I guess, is it Yeah, that, thank you so much for yeah. that segue, yeah. because that is, that is so important. Um, Ricardo Thomas, who works with us on our African American Leadership Council, says that lack of planning is hazardous to our wealth and our health because we don't have those plans, we don't have those conversations. And so often, my background prior to working with Compassionate Voices was as a chaplain. And so I would see in hospitals and in hospices, people's lives change in an instant. And the family conflict that comes with that, because we have not designated a healthcare proxy, because we haven't talked about an advanced directive, because we haven't thought, it's things we don't want to think about, but like, would I want to be on the family? Would I want to have a feeding tube? How would I want my life sustained if, if, you know, if I couldn't speak for myself? And so I always tell people that those conversations are so important to have because you don't want your family to be in conflict about it. You want to be able to say, this is exactly how I'm honoring my loved one. This is what they would want. And getting really real, it's very important for us not to just write it down, but to have the conversations because so often in our community, advanced directives aren't always honored. So people might have it written down, but we know how inequities in healthcare work in our community. So it is so important to have someone that can advocate for us so that we can have choice and agency at the end of life and throughout our life and throughout our lives because we have to know what questions to ask, how to talk about it, how to Get the plan of care that the doctor is doing and we can't do that in a crisis it's something that we have to talk about before wow well let's let that silence just sit there for a second because it's it's very educational you know i feel like you learned something i learned something you know just listening um you know and i i, I really i really appreciate you guys coming through and um, definitely sponsoring this episode and making it come to life. So I want to thank you guys, uh, Compassionate Choices, for sponsoring this episode and wanting to do this in the barbershop, in Plush Midtown, Steph's Barbershop. 
Um, we we do a lot of great things here. So we got three more episodes down, three more episodes to do. Um, I hope you guys felt the, the warmth and as soon as you guys set foot in the door and um, Steph, do you have anything you want to end with before we wrap this episode? Anybody have anything before we wrap it up? Um, no, I just appreciate you for the platform and uh, bringing all of these different topics, um, giving us a chance to tell our story, our experiences, and what it is that we want to see for our own community. Um, you provide a platform for that on many different subjects. You know, some subjects are fun, some more serious and different, and that just represents what happens in the barbershop. There's times when we're laughing and joking, and there are times when we get serious about certain things, man. So just thank you uh, to you, and thank you all as well for, you know, doing the work that you do. Uh, it really does make a difference. And a lot of times when you guys do what you do, maybe you don't hear thank you a whole lot because it's kind of behind the scenes type of stuff. So um, just appreciate you guys, man, because each, like I say, each one, reach one, each one, teach yeah, one. Yeah. Um, each each person that you reach out to and influence, you help change the trajectory of, of their generation. So kudos to you guys. I appreciate that. Um, I'll leave you all with this proverb. From, from the Akan uh, group in Ghana um, that says that uh, we must uh, move with the understanding of Sankofa, which is an indicative symbol. It means, uh, you know, to go back in order uh, to know where you're going in order to know where you're going. So it says we must go back with uh, Sankofa seven generations in order to prepare for the next seven generations. Mm. 14 generations. And this is how they move. So when we're thinking about this conversation, it's the next seven generations that we're thinking about. Um, and every day you can do something for those generations. Wow. Well, I appreciate you guys. Um, but Elijah, before we wrap up, did you get that jacket from God? <laughs> get that jacket from God. I did. And uh, I'm working with a seamstress out there. She's amazing. Shout out to Ghana. Yes, I was there a month ago. If I can get you, I, I got you. Let me know. Uh, we okay. can make it happen. Okay, cool. <laughs> Just went in on the laughter because, you know, in the barbershop, we will keep it real. As you saw, we keep it real. And then we definitely, you know, on the roller coaster. But this is, a, this is one of the best episodes I think I've done. Bet on the educational aspect side of things. So... Hey, Red Flush Midtown, Compassion Choices, they are the sponsorship. Thank you so much for just investing in this 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 greatness of our, our series that we got going. Yep. Thank you so much. This, this wraps the episode.